the anecdotal reports of I took this many grams and I still felt nothing um, mm. seems to, you know, they're not entirely common, but obviously, you know, with the internet, they're easy to find these days. And I'm curious if since then um, you've, you've followed up, done, you know, further research or conferred with other colleagues to get a sense of why it might be that people are resistant. I know previously, um, oof, people are resistant. Uh, people aren't experiencing effects. I'd like to be clear yeah. that that's what I mean. Um, yeah. I know uh, previously with the work of Stan Groff uh, with LSD, he had mentioned that he it had felt it had something to do with a like a compulsive holding in the psyche that once they mm -hmm. fed them enough LSD to break that, I think in one point I had read something like 1500 micrograms. Then after that, they could give them a normal person's dose. Um, yeah. But possibly there, there are other things happening here. So I'm just curious mm -hmm. what, uh, what you've come to, what you've come to learn at this point. Well, it's one of the things that in our team we've been most interested in. So we have um, in the, the current psilocybin for depression study, the, the larger study, we have this amazing team of, uh, it's a really wonderful team. The six of us, we've been, completely all of us completely absorbed in this world of learning about what's happening so we are kind of on whatsapp discussing the final points at like 11 o'clock at night and six in the morning we're you know we're just all in this absolute bubble of psilocybin for depression and really enjoying learning and developing tentative hypotheses and sharing them so we have talked as a group at length about this topic um because we've seen it in the current study as well. As, as you mentioned, there are these anecdotal reports and for sure we've, we've seen it again that for some people it, it doesn't seem to work. Um, and I think that's very interesting what you say about Stan Groff and this this holding on. And I, I feel that there is this sense of, um, well, the, the idea that we've come up with is that for some people it is just so, so hard to trust that even in our setting where we um, spend a lot of time building that trust and have, you know, good number of hours of preparation first and they're in a very safe setting, that for some people there is this, there is this holding on because it just doesn't feel safe and that they might be people that actually, upon reflection, when we think about them in the screening, that we might actually have felt on an interpersonal level a slight that we can we think that we're starting to develop a sense for what that might look like earlier mm. on mm. So we're starting to develop a, a kind of intuition about which people are the people that would probably need a lot more support in order to be able to let go and so we might we might not say yes to them in the study because actually we can only offer what we can offer so if people have a lot of trauma in their past but that is manifesting in a distance interpersonally. It, when we feel that it's hard to connect with somebody and we, we feel that it's, it takes a bit more time to build that rapport, we realize that that seems to be, I mean, we're talking about such small numbers here that we can't make any really firm conclusions. But, um, but yeah, my sense would be that dose would certainly come into it. And that for these people, if, if we'd given them a much bigger dose than maybe they would have, you know, there would have been just this kind of breakthrough. They wouldn't have been able to hold on. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly like this image in my mind is like of somebody um, kind of jumping off a cliff and kind of, or like, ab, you know, abseiling. Like, I remember once I went abseiling and um, I was so petrified of, of the whole thing. Wait, abseiling is like paragliding? Uh, no, <laughs> so like, okay, so basically you, you stand, you stand with your back to a cliff edge and you have a rope. And what you do is you like jump down and you go down the cliff backwards, jumping. Do you know what I mean? Have you seen it? So you're holding onto the rope, you're facing the cliff or the mountain, and you let. And what you have to do in order to do that is you have to let go and then hold on again. So you go down in these like jumps. Hmm. So you have to let go of the rope, but then you hold on again so you don't fall all the way down. So you just let go and hold, let go and hold. So there's a lot of trust involved. And I remember doing this exercise when I was like 15 at some school trip. And whereas other people were able to jump off and let go and hold and let go and hold, so they would go down like that, I couldn't let go. So I held my hands on the whole way down. At the, at the bottom, my hands were bleeding. Mm. 
because mm. rather than letting go, I just held on to the rope the whole time. And I, I feel like with some people, it's a bit like that, that rather than letting go, they are just going to hold on, even if it means that their hands are going to bleed, that they just, some part of them just is, is too frightened to let go. So, I, yeah, I think that maybe with those people, if you give them a really high dose, um, it's almost like that person on the mountain, like like just pushing them off. But I also wonder whether rather than going straight to that, it might be better for us to develop models where we give people that need it so much more preparation and so much more support that actually, and also start with a smaller dose, getting a bit higher, getting a bit higher, that for those people, they might be led more gently into feeling safe enough to feel something. Because I also know from ayahuasca circles that there'll often be one person that doesn't experience anything. You know, there'll be one one person in a ceremonial space that just says that the medicine isn't working. Um, Someone he was talking about the other day, it's like the NADA experience. And I just wonder whether it would be very interesting to kind of interview all those people, get them all together and interview them and, and, and try and work out whether there was some, maybe unconscious, but... Um, sense of unsafety um Mm. in the environment because of how they were feeling that day or just just not feeling quite safe to let go Mm. yeah i think uh safety is an interesting uh interesting consideration and i also want to probe a little bit more um because i'm not i i don't think this is what you mean although what you had said could have been interpreted as though this was a choosing uh Mm, that there there was like a a choosing of resistance and i'm just wondering about Obviously, it's not like I can just choose not to experience my psilocybin. And there's yeah. sort of like a neurobiological choice that's being made. Cause so I actually heard from somebody maybe about two months ago who asked me my opinion on what they should do because they deeply, deeply wanted the experience and they've yeah. been giving themselves crazy amounts of mushrooms and still nothing's happening. Um, and so can you maybe unpack a little bit more on, yeah. on, that, yeah. on that difference? Yes. Um, you know, it's certainly not, I mean, because I mean, if you think about the people in the study, they've put themselves through immense inconvenience to, to be there and they really, really want it to work. It's certainly not a, a conscious choice. It's more about what, um, what they're able to, yeah, what, I think it probably links to polyvagal theory oh, in some way. Great. Yeah. I'm there with you. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I'm just trying to think about how I'm going to, because yeah, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to speak about this in any with any proficiency because it's something that I'm only just really discovering myself. But I think that, um, you know, there's the ventral vagal and there's this dorsal vagal pathway. And from what I understand it is that when there is when somebody's system is overwhelmed with with unsafety, that there's a shutting down. Mm-hmm. And um, I wonder about whether in that position there are mechanisms that we don't even know about like I don't know how how the system responds like I had a conversation with somebody um who was was talking about the body's releasing of opiates under certain conditions of stress so whether that could counter out counteract a response to psychedelics or something like on a neurobiological level I'm sure that there are processes that kick in that might put the brakes on if if something is so feels so dangerous for the organism then the organism shuts down the, the the dorsal vagal kind of playing dead. Mm-hmm. So I wonder whether that has an as an impact. I mean, I think that's one subset. I think um, the shamanic interpretation would be different. I know there is this idea of the the nada experience. Um, I can't remember the details of it, but I'm I'm sure there is an explanation of what that's about. And I, I mean, I guess what my supervisor would say, who's a holotropic breathwork expert and amazing psychiatrist and has lots of experience in altered states and working with it's through the holotropic breathwork paradigm but much of it is very applicable to psychedelics he would just say you know it's kind of what the person is ready for and what what is right for them at the time Mm -hmm. which i think is a very compelling way of seeing that the organism there's this homeostatic balancing system and if actually your system doesn't need a big jolt then you're not going to get a big jolt but i think that that rationale would sound very difficult for your the person you're talking about who is really seeking something and nothing's happening Mm -hmm. it would be probably difficult for him to buy into the idea that that's what was right for him Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so 
I wonder whether the person you're talking about, whether with him, was it a man? I'm not going to reveal their gender, but you could say him in the in the default way. Yeah. yeah. So with with him, I I wonder whether if um. I wonder whether if he was to work with somebody over a longer period of time, um, maybe do some breath work together, maybe do some other kinds of intervention together, build up a real sense of trust and safety um, and, exp- and and try much smaller doses, first of all, rather than trying to go for these huge doses and building up just to see if there's anything and having an, an approach of curiosity. So rather than hoping for the big breakthrough, going into the experience, the intention of, being open to whatever comes up and just being curious as to any any changes there might be but not really being it so attached to that outcome and just over time building up building up I wonder whether in that circumstance after a few months of that kind of work maybe um, there would be more potential for experiencing stronger effects but of course it's I mean how do you do that and when psychedelics are illegal you know right, that's, right, the, right. that's the big question you know, that's the thing like that's what's very frustrating because the way we do it at the moment is just one tiny way of doing it. We you know we have to jump through all these hoops to get our approvals and, you know, and then you have, it's so expensive to do these studies and you do it in this very prescriptive way. And I just can't wait for when we can experiment with more protocols and different types of intervention. And, and I, I'm confident that we will work out in time. Well, of course we will. So much more about who it's right for, how we can optimize it, how we can help maximize the potential of it. But at the moment, we know so, so little, mm-hmm. um, have so many questions. Um, and the, sci- the science is, has been quite divorced from a ceremony context, obviously, and the underground, where there's so much more experience. Um, and I have actually spoken to people from, from those settings about this question of when it doesn't work and... Um, yeah, there's been a, a variety of different responses, but I think something around having a lot of trauma that has not yet been a lot of trauma kind of waiting back down that, that could respond so strongly if it were to respond that it shuts down through a kind of safety mechanism, something mm. around that. I think it's probably the most common response. But um, what we are trying to do at Imperial is to um start to work a bit more closely with those settings through the survey study that we do so the psychedelic survey we're joining up with lots of different ceremonies uh retreat centers to collect data from thousands of people that are going through psychedelic work themselves and i think that's going to be a really good step towards answering these kind of questions mm-hmm. because we'll have a much bigger data set and also we're yeah w- with bigger numbers you can just ask questions of the data much more easily mm-hmm interesting yeah go ahead well i was just going to say i don't know whether we have um specific questions on there about about these kind of experiences but um there probably is yeah Mm -hmm. yeah there's there's definitely several things there that had run through my mind when i got the email from that person um one of which was this uh and i've seen it in others this like very strong um like call that it needs to be this uh and and I, yeah. I look at that sort of. Um, this, I hope that this isn't being heard by the person and perceived in a, in a judgmental or, or negative way, but as like a another expression of what might be the same control, hyper yeah. hyper vigilant control uh, tendencies that are leading to the very incapacity to feel or experience the high or the release. And uh, definitely um, appreciated your mention of polyvagal theory and just even thinking of it something akin to how somebody can just move through their day feeling totally numb, not realizing that they're deeply sad, not having any idea what sadness feels like, that they're sad or or that sort of um, a classic example of like, why are you so angry right now? I'm not angry. You know, like yeah. people don't even feel their anger. So possibly there's some... You know, there's there's some mechanism, be it, I mean, obviously there's going to be, it's a holistic system. So if there's a response in one part of the body, then there's a, other responses happening, you know, concurrently. Uh, but there's some sort of response that's dissociating the the sensory experience of the psilocybin from the uh, from the conscious awareness of the of the participant, be it related maybe to uh, the uh, dorsal vagal parasympathetic yeah. dissociation process. Mm-hmm. 